Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to our episodes. And thank you for all of the communication and support that I've received over the past couple of weeks. It's been so exciting. The launch of our course this month has been incredible. Thank you so much for all that support and interest and sharing. And listen, if you are, if there's anything that I can do to help you out in your journey with running a label or starting a label, uh, uh, reach out to me. My email is podcast at otherrecordlabels.com. I'd love to hear from you. I love getting those emails. Please do that. Um, please leave a review in iTunes. Um, I don't think you can do reviews in, in Spotify. I'm not sure. And then just visit our website, otherrecordlabels.com. Um, there's a, you know, this, this, uh, during this, this string of episodes, we've been kind of focusing on the topic of marketing and promotions and in-house PR for record labels. And I've got this checklist that I'm sharing with you. You can go to otherrecordlabels.com slash marketing and download this um, marketing checklist. It's got like 20 odd things in it that I try to do um, whenever I'm releasing a new record. And that's kind of the theme of these episodes over the next couple of weeks that we're focusing on. So you can grab a copy of that at otherrecordlabels.com slash marketing. Today's interview is with Earth Libraries, such an interesting label. This is a husband and wife duo, which is, I think, our first on the show officially. Um, and uh, it's it's such a great uh, conversation with Bree and Bryant of Earth Libraries. And and I love the, you got to go to their website, earthlibraries.com and, and check them out. They're doing some reissues now. And it, what's so cool about this concept, and we dig into it in this episode of, of archiving and, and cementing music and and us as record labels kind of acting as historians and 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 recording this music in more ways than just one and and, and saving this music for future generations such a cool concept anyway check out this label and I hope you enjoy this interview is it possible that I could run to my kitchen real quick and grab a cup of coffee oh my god oh I, man what a diva I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. You said that right when I, I made a glass of water and a coffee. I made the water. I was prepared. I had my <laughs> coffee before the call, and I had a water set up for the call. And then right when I gave you the number, he's like, I'm going to go make coffee. Make and I was like, coffee. what? Like, <laughs> this is happening now. Part of my um, job of like. But he actually, I will say, has. He has like a nine to five in the IT world. Oh, okay. Uh, so he was literally on a call up until <laughs> a couple of minutes ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, you need to have those coffee yeah. breaks every like couple of minutes. Let me ask you, yeah. um, especially while yeah. he's gone, um, this is like a husband and wife team. <laughs> like that's pretty, that's pretty strange. You don't hear that very often. Oh, do you not? No. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of new, but it's been going well. Um, yeah, before I was uh, a professional photographer, I mean, I guess I still am, but okay. I did that for 10 years. Okay. Um, That's a good skill to have at a label. It is, um, especially with like, I'm used to marketing and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and the, having the... Fo- good quality photos and like when bands need that we can kind of save some money there if the band's nearby for me to photograph yeah yeah totally Um, but yeah and then we moved to Boise not too long ago um and so when we made the move I was sort of like uh I guess I could have started rebranding my photography business but I decided we had only the label had been running for like a year or so. And I offered to work on the label full time if he wanted me to not bring in yeah. the other income. Yeah. And cause this seemed to be his um, passion project. So I right. was, and he had been supporting my passion project for like, you know, the 10 years prior. That's so awesome. I kind of gave in to helping uh, with the label full time. Are you guys just like doing whatever needs to be done or do you have an area of focus and does he have an area of focus? Um, I feel like we're all over. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone, people that need help in any part of the label. Uh, 
I feel like I wear many hats. I'll right. Say that. Oh, sure. I bet. <laughs> I'm. I feel like I'm the distributor and you know the marketing and um, you know designing the merch. Yeah. <laughs> and, um. Yeah. There's a lot, but yeah, the husband wife thing has been sort of working. I'd say. <laughs> what do you say? He's back now. He's back. <laughs> Yeah, I am. Um, let's see. I mean, it started with I think just me, and then there was a part time person that that hired just to do kind of uploads to our digital distribution and kind of just help get some things started. Yeah, and we also had a friend that did our website, but there was a time where I think I did everything, and I think uh, and now I do everything. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Honestly, that's kind of true. Bree does like most of the daily business operations, like like eight to five, like mm-hmm. pretty much everything you can think of. Uh, I am mostly doing A and R, or maybe like finding, you know, different resources to make the release possible, like video or artwork or something sure. like that. Uh, sometimes that actually is Bree <laughs> doing yeah. the artwork. <laughs> the uh, um, that's where the photography is helpful yeah. uh, with yeah. editing and all that. Yeah. Right. Cause you know, you're away around Photoshop and so, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. We, yeah. We also have one person that does, um, about 10 hours a week, just kind of catching us up in areas where we've kind of fallen behind. Like publishing is one thing we like didn't have everything registered. You know, we were setting up artists with PROs and all that stuff. So we, we actually, I had one person just work for 10 hours a week for like a few months just to get that, like our back catalog called up and right. kind of get that process going for us. Well, that's um, great. So yeah, we, I think that person is probably actually about to shift to like another project like that. Um, helping us clean up areas where we're haven't fully done it with our catalog or something like yeah. that. Yeah. That's great to, to get organized and even going back into history and get or, organized that there's a, ton of things I would love to have time to do like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you... Are, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, we are trying very hard to get organized. I feel like that is like key to making the light will be successful. And um, it, there are just so many moving parts <laughs> that you have to... Well, uh, well, it's it's boring, but it enables the exciting stuff. That's what I always have to <laughs> remind myself. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I kind of left a creative industry to come be a technical industry yeah. <laughs> that does have a creative element for sure. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. a lot of technical. <laughs> it's yeah. something that I think a lot of new label owners will learn pretty quickly that like the creative stuff starts to shrink and shrink to where it's like 10% creative and 90% QuickBooks, <laughs> spreadsheets, exactly. forms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Emailing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you explain the name to me? And, and actually explain how this all came together. Okay. Uh, did, did, you, uh, did you happen to read our backstory on our website? I did a little bit, yes. But I, I, I need you to kind of uh, to flesh it out for me. Okay. Um. Well, it um, it's really the whole concept is a creative concept, I guess. You know, there's a hints of truth and things that we're inspired of that's in that bio. But and really, you know, as the bio sort of ends, we're just a uh, modern record label, essentially. But I kind of take an inspiration from like academics um, mm. of and just archival work. And and just the need to uh, get things accessible. I think that was sort of part of what inspired me to do the record label. It was as um, I was trying to find things on streaming services and they were only on Bandcamp. Mm. And, or, you know, I was in a a few bands and our music was only on Bandcamp or something like that. And I wanted to just explore with that side of it. And and so I kind of felt like there was like this, kind of mission um you know we we looked at a bunch of different names and when it we kind of settled on that we it kind of felt like there was a need to create a mythology around it sure and um i think we're just 
influenced by like, you know, um, you know, some of the things I mentioned, like archival work, ethnomusicology, yeah. uh, and sort of like some fundamental mission that we're actually preserving, you know, something during a time when things could be destroyed, uh, kind of yeah, harking yeah. back to like world wars and things like that. And, Alexandria. And so nothing mm. that's kind of where the name kind of comes from. I love that idea. I love the idea of archiving and even just in the simple form. And I think every label owner does it in a way as a curator that just in this idea, I mean, I've always had this, um, a li- this fantasy or this weird mental picture of like my grandkids discovering my attic and pulling out all these tapes and CDs and vinyl that grandpa recorded and released and you know what I mean like I just have this like if if anything like we are making real things and we are enabling like history to to be formed if only for our our grandkids to discover yeah you know I'll, I'll share like a little story um that uh was like kind of an emotional moment I had um I was kind of feeling like the stress of the amount of money we were putting into the label. Yeah. And uh, simultaneously, like one of the things we do is actually find unreleased old recordings and go through a whole process of getting authorization, trying to find the original ar- artist mm-hmm. and uh, usually like obscure local music from the fifties and sixties. And, and so I, some of those things I've discovered in a basement and we have a, 50, 50 brand new copies of a record that came out in 1961, I think it was. Like the box of, uh, it was like leftover stock, found stock. And I really, I got so much personal joy of finding that stock hmm. and re-releasing it out to the world. And I just started sort of imagining like all of our new music, which is really the majority of our catalog. I started imagining somebody doing that in the future and sort of like it made me feel like everything was okay. Like uh, in the worst case scenario, somebody like me will find this one day. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, and they'll get joy and satisfaction. And um, yeah, I don't know. No, that's bad. great. Well, listen, if you're looking for a basement full of um, unused <laughs> records, <laughs> you can come to my yeah. house and pretend that you've discovered those. Okay, <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Uh, that the uh, the archival process. I'm so. Um, I'm so curious about and and the whole idea of reissues. I think that is really cool. I want to I want to get into that. Um, can you just tell me quickly? And and, and Bree and I were talking a little bit about the various roles that you guys have um, when you were making coffee. Um, but who who else do you have involved with the label at the moment? Like just like the team itself. Yeah, uh, it's mainly. Bree and I, we have another person, Anna, that, that's doing publishing and, and works part time. There's another person, Josh, who is starting to work part time and is on the label, actually. Yeah, he's in the band Juniper Berries. Okay. And um, was just inspired to want to help more. So we hired him. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. Actually, yeah. And uh, we've had a rotating cast of help. And like we have a, we have a handful of graphic designers or really just a few. And really, oh, honestly, good. one per- person that's like, done most of our design. Um, and, you know, we've had one person really do the majority of our website, although we update it now, but they helped us set it up. And we have a bookkeeper that we hired to do our accounting. Nice. Um, That's smart. And yeah, I don't, yeah, if it feels necessary, certainly. <laughs> so many revenue streams. Um, yeah. And just, oh, like, yeah. Or an invoice with two bands on it, and you know, from our website, and all that stuff has to be broken out. Sure. Or, and so, yeah, I think that kind of makes up the team. Um, so, going back to this archival thing and and finding records in the basement, I was reading something about you about like getting your early start in some in digital restoration. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, growing up, um, my dad was a record collector and. One of the, I mean, honestly, it set right alongside doing the dishes and stuff was actually digitizing 45s as a kid. Mm. Um, like it was like, okay, can you sit in the basement and record all these 45s, son? <laughs> and, your, dad, uh, your dad wanted you to do it or you were interested in doing it? Um, my dad wanted us to do it, I think. I mean, then I was 
interested in doing it at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so the um, yeah, so like it was uh, it wasn't just you know recording them for just any sake. It was because they hadn't been they didn't make it to the CD era at that time. Oh wow! Uh, and so it was just you know records he wanted and a few of the there's a in Birmingham there's a record collectors group called the Birmingham record collectors and they a few of the members started learning how to digitize music and uh, yeah learn how to do like like you know the whole process of removing pops and clicks removing noise and really sort of making a master out of the 45 because mm. the original recordings were were lost at right, that point sure so you just had to take your best known copy of it and and so, yeah, there's lots of interesting techniques. Like when you, you know, when you put a record on and it, there's like the dead wax, it's like before the record starts playing, sure. it, it, goes, it goes around. And so usually that creates like a noise footprint that's kind of consistent throughout the whole record. And oh. In void of music at that point. And so uh, there's like, you can use that to kind of, remove the noise. I you can, see. You create, uh, you create like a uh, picture of that and then remove that from within the music. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And sometimes it's really, it's really is tricky. It's, it really is an art. Like you can accidentally completely remove symbols and just yes. like you, um, right. And so, so yeah, it's like, uh, and I, but growing up, there were some songs I've heard hundreds of times because I've listened to them meticulously, like millisecond by millisecond, like finding the, <laughs> the, the, the thing sometimes just looking at the wave itself to identify it and then hand drawing it back and wow. stuff like that. Wow. So that's sort of, yeah. That's that's, yeah. That's a really cool process. And I, and so a lot of these records that, and then what was your dad doing with them? It was just for his own personal use. Yeah, actually. Yeah. They, they, uh, you know, he, we would actually make homemade CDs, uh, and like, uh, they put them in cases and print covers and everything, but they were really just distributed to this record collecting world. Wow. Like, like we sometimes we would make a hundred of these CDs homemade and stuff like that, but they would you know, just be brought to the monthly record club meeting or to the <laughs> annual record show or something like that. And does you ever, I, I mean, did you ever try to reach out to the people who made these at all? Like to, to find out like, are, are anybody interested in these songs or, um, you know, why weren't they brought to the digital services later on? Yeah. Uh, so, um, a, a lot of these were, you know, I, I've actually learned more in recent years than, you know, some of the stories, but during that time period, some of these were just local releases or oh. regional releases. And so they you know, were from the fifties and sixties, uh, mostly, and these particular recordings were, and yeah, we could find those people locally. And sometimes those those people would come speak at the record club meetings and, and things like that. That's so and, cool. Yeah. So there was like a, a bit of authorization, but what I've done in the last five years is actually go back to those recordings and find them again and like sort of do it officially, like basically sign them to the label. And, wow. and so that's sort of like what Earth Library has kind of made that process look maybe a little bit more official and kind of more in line with the actual business of of the music industry. Okay, so walk me through that process if you are going to do a reissue for someone who is you are and you're able to find the artist or their representatives or their estate. Walk me through that process. What's involved um, in that process of of getting permission and getting the masters and getting it ready and and creating modern artwork to make it you know appealable to the the new generation. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... You know, usually it starts with me just like using the smallest amount of information I have on it, like information that might be on the record label itself, just some Googling. Mm -hmm. And I'll, you know, find the person maybe on Facebook or we've even gone into like genealogy to kind of find people and stuff <laughs> wow. like that too. So, <laughs> yeah. And um, somehow I'll eventually get a phone number and I'll get to talk to somebody. I've talked. I, I spend a lot of time speaking to people in their eighties and nineties now, actually. Wow. And, and so we talk, I, some people, you know, everybody's a little bit different. Some people are like, 
I don't even know why you like this recording. I, I it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, then, and then some people are like, I still want to be a rock and roll star. Like <laughs> I, I, I definitely have that. Um, and, uh, and, and you, yeah, I can think of one particular quote. This one guy's like, all I want is the fame. You can have the fortune, Bryant. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's like, uh, yeah, every story is a little bit unique, but essentially we uh, signed them to the label, like in the same terms that we sign a new band. Wow. Uh, and so... Uh, and in most cases, there there wouldn't have been any other label involved? Yeah, so, okay, yeah, that's the other part. Yeah, so um, sometimes these are, you know, basically what... Um, us, a record label that had only released three things or 10 things. Mm-hmm. They were from 60 to 61 or 65 or something like that. So, you know, some small period. And yeah, there's like some work to kind of figure out if that is now been bought by Sony 10 years later, or and sometimes, sometimes those end up being sort of dead ends for us. Okay. Um, but we have now started reaching out to uh, those major labels about licensing. We've, we've licensed uh, two songs from Sony at this point that were part of just a really small record label that they picked up in their like acquisition Interesting. track. Uh, and so, but a lot of times these record labels are completely defunct. Sometimes we can't find uh, the people at all, yeah. uh, the original people. In, in some cases, these people might have been in their 50s or 60s in the 60s that were running the <laughs> Right, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So there's there can be a significant gap between it. Like sometimes I'm talking to people's their kids, and they're like in their 40s or 50s now. And yeah. So um, crazy. Yeah, and usually everybody just wants to do it for just for the good nature of it all, and and so yeah, that's sort of sort of how it goes. Do they have any illusions that that you're going to make them rich? That you're going to pull them from obscurity? And are, are are they are they signing these contracts hoping that you're going to? Um, get them on Johnny Carson. <laughs> I, uh, I wish we had that actually in a way, but not really. No. Usually, uh, I usually t- temper the expectations. They, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's but good. I, I mean, I hope that the, there's a lot of interest in, you know, your music and, you know, that, that is a potential. I, I mean, we're definitely influenced by labels like Numero Group and Light the Attic. Sure. And, and so we hope that things like that happen for the artist, but, uh, it's just cool to have it out there. Yeah, yeah. How do you know if people are going to like it? Because if something is an undiscovered gem, in your opinion, how do you prevent it from not becoming an undiscovered gem again? I'm trying to process that, actually. <laughs> take, uh, take your time. <laughs> um, I don't know, actually. I mean, the we're just... Um, you know, so far I'll say most of them I've had some sort of personal connection with, like it was a record my dad listened to a million times growing up or something like that. Right. Um, and so I have some sort of bias probably towards liking and interest in it, but you know, there's a lot of music nowadays that is pretty derivative and it's really hard to recreate the sound of these errors and stuff. Oh, sure. and I just think it's really cool that we have sort of authentic work from the eras in our catalog. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, we're trying to tell the story of these releases. We, we actually have a pretty decent backlog of things we could release that we haven't because we really haven't found enough additional assets to make it interesting. Okay. Um, Can you like, explain uh, that? Like, like we may just have a 45 and the audio. No picture of the band. Uh, <laughs> right. We don't have a, no bio. There's nothing really to say about it. And maybe that has its own mystique, but uh, it kind of then takes us to like then figure out to compile enough of it to maybe make a comp or, or something like that. Um, or but it, in film. Or in film. Yeah. That, a lot of the stuff actually, we, I think, yeah, has a real potential just for sync licensing and stuff too. I see. Just for the, just for the authentic. Uh, and sound of that era uh, that they might be going for. Even if it's like a, a scratchy 45 sound? I will say most of these restorations actually sound pretty good. I oh, think okay. 
Yeah, it's actually, uh, yeah, it's actually incredible, like how different they might sound from the Scratchy Forty Five. Well, a lot of us who are, uh, you know, moderately young, like uh, our exposure to like some of these Forty Fives were from yard sales, and you would take them home, and they were complete garbage sounding. Uh, not the music, but the quality. So I am, but I imagine you might be able to get your hands on ones that have been preserved by people like your father, who respected them from the day they bought them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, we're definitely trying to find like the mint copy of sure. it. Yeah. Sure, sometimes we're just borrowing it for somebody and stuff like that too. But yeah, the digital restoration process is surprising sometimes. Like, uh, like the before and after could be like you know indiscernible, and then afterwards it actually sounds like maybe a potentially a, I wouldn't say a studio recording. Yeah, um, but you know something in between. There's there's not distracting noise or pops and clicks. It just maybe has a, a slight lower fidelity. Well, you're spot on about the the recording process too, because there's a lot of bands today, like pop artists too, who are emulating that 60s and 70s and 80s and and pretty soon 90s sound. And there's something like when you put on an old record, you're like, man, you just cannot capture that like i don't know if it was their limitations if it was their whatever restrictions they had that actually made it sound better than people today who have unlimited resources but there's something about the sound it's incredible yeah i think um a handful of our new artists on the label do have this nostalgic i guess oh, okay do you aim for that it. is that something you look for I don't think we meant to, but I think we realized once we started looking at the whole catalog that that was like a time factor. Sure. Yeah, and- I, I I love this idea that maybe people would maybe not know if it's new world on the label. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah, like, um, like, I, I, yeah. I mean, we have a, a pretty wide range of music. I think on our new side, but I think there is. Almost generally in music, unless it's like a hyper electronic modern type thing, um, if it's you know if it's a, a rock band setup, it's you're almost likely you know deriving some influences somehow. Mm. And and I don't know sometimes like yeah, I think something like the unreleased obscure stuff has the most potential to sound new also as like an old thing because. Um, I don't know. And there's just a lot more niche genres nowadays that are a little bit weirder. Yeah. And maybe the reason why that original song wasn't a hit was because it was a bit weird. Sure. And, and so it sort of ends up having this similarity, even though from two different angles. Well, yeah. And I mean, I've noticed in releasing music, even just nowadays, that timing is uh, plays a huge role. And you could be the first person to use auto tune in a folk song. Or you could be the thirtieth person to use auto tune in a folk song, and it's all just about coming in at the right time. If people are hungry for '80s, you know, Lind drums and 808s, then you might just be there at the right time. So maybe for some of these artists, it wasn't the right time for them now, but it works, or or that back then, but it works now. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, just to add this, I don't just for additional knowledge of like our process, we've actually remixed some of these old recordings and made new songs out of them. Oh, too. really? Mm-hmm. We have, uh, that's cool. We've only released one, but we made about 10 new songs where we just strictly sampled from the original songs and they sound completely modern and different. Actually. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, and was that, and in those cases was the artist like involved with the original artist involved at all, or how, did they get to hear it? Yeah. In this particular case they did and they really liked it. That's uh, cool. Yeah. That's really were, cool. Yeah. That's going to really confuse the the ar- <laughs> archaeologists or the, the people who dig these up and go, well, I found the original recording, but then this version here it sounds, it's going to be hard for the historians. <laughs> do you that's have, our goal. Yeah, that's our goal. That's your goal. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do you have, does the old releases... Uh, by the way, I love the idea of the that you have new records coming out, and then you have reissues, and that you're trying to blur those lines. I think that is kind of a cool thing. 
but do you have new artwork for the, in some cases for the, the old reissues? Like I know there's some labels out there who will reissue something and give it a completely modern look and I'll be listening to it for half an hour. And it's this, you know, instrumental, uh, synth mo synth record or something. And I'm like, and then I find out it's a 50 year old record, but uh, what's the artwork like for some of these reissues? Yeah, um, you know, kind of really depends on like our ability to gather like photos and other assets and things. But I, I think we take a sort of classic archival view of like the reissues. So okay. like if it's like a forty-five, we might just use the original forty-five itself as the artwork. Oh, cool! Uh, but, um, I think if we were reissuing an LP, we would probably try to recreate it and make it authentic. Yeah, um, and I think for like compilations and stuff, we would probably you know, collage photography, include scans of the labels. We'd probably be pretty, you know, archival. Like, hey, here's all the, you know, information you can see about this music and here and, and here's all the information we could provide. I think it would be that also kind of our, I think our graphic designer's style is kind of similar to that period of time. Okay. So it's also even some of our newer stuff will have that older feel to it. So once again, we're blurring the lines. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like that. That is kind of cool. I'm just, uh, I'm trying to pull up your band camp here as we talk, just so I can have some visuals in mind. But yeah, I'm trying to think what's even on our band camp. Yeah, I want to pull it up too. That's yeah. hard yeah. to do. Everybody is- pull it up. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, did I hear that you have a, a Suzanne Chaney record coming out? I couldn't find info on that. Yeah, so we're not. Um, it was picked up as an exclusive record store day release. Oh. Um, so it comes out September 26th. Oh, um, okay. It, yeah, it, 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 it's not on our band camp. I don't think we have because it Because we're not allowed to. It's record only. Yes, yeah, the vinyl only release. Oh. Um, yeah, oh, and so uh, just on our website, you can order the... Um, well, it's, it's going to be on Record Store Day exclusively, uh, and then afterward, there, there's a second pressing that will actually sell through our website also. Along That's with amazing. the documentary, um, there's a Blu-ray DVD documentary on her um, that we're the only one. We're exclusively selling it. Nobody else is. That's amazing. Can you talk me through that process? I mean, that, that's a pretty huge deal. Yeah, um, I think it's like uh, just how we got connected with Suzanne was just circumstantial um but yeah i mean she's a five-time grammy nominee you know pioneer in 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 the music industry Mm. you know incredible commercial work really cool ambient early synthesizer albums you know i think her all her grammy nominees were for her new age music later and uh yeah she you know has a really cool story the blue i mean the documentary really is amazing. Everyone should see it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I actually, I think I, the link he, keeps coming up in my feed and, and, um, Oh good. I need to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. Oh, the That's record so, looks beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how we did that was, okay. So, um, uh, I'm actually a executive producer on that film too. And oh, cool. And how we got involved w- with that film is because we're just friends with the, the directors, Brad and Brad. Okay. And they have a window pictures is their uh, production company and they produce several documentaries. And, um, I, we kind of, we kind of, as we became friends with them, we started getting involved, um, you know, really just in the, that producer role, but with Suzanne, as I was doing the musical or the thing with the record label, we decided just to ask if we could release the soundtrack for the film, mm. basically, you know, serving as a career retrospective too. And we reached out to Suzanne and we signed her for, to the label for that release, which is really awesome. That's <laughs> unbelievable. And that's also now led to um, several films we're working on now. So Great. we've done a couple other soundtracks that we've been compiled for a film. And now we have other, I guess, filmmakers reaching out to us about releasing their soundtracks on, you know, social platforms, yeah. as well as like merchandise to go alongside with their uh, film release, um, just to have. 
So that's kind of that's really something cool. new we've been doing. Sure. That. We're, we're really into it. <laughs> um, so do you have these in stock? Like, the the records are do you ha- have you held one and touched one? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh well, cool. we first originally sold out of the record of Suzanne Chani to Record Store Day, um, but we ordered a second. Um, okay. So was was this supposed to be out in April? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what a bummer. It's been quite a journey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We've really been wanting to get it out to the world for a long time And now. so when was it officially available? Was it available for the the August Record Store Day or whenever that fell? I'm not sure. It's, no, it's, 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 has, a, it's the second drop in September. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I so, see. So yeah, yeah not yet. Okay. September 26th, I believe. But it, it sold out through the distribution channels, all the, all oh. the stores. It'll, so it'll, it'll be in whatever stores it's in and it's out and then... We I guess, yeah, sold out to all the stores. <laughs> yeah, and then sure. internationally, it'll be available October 2nd. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, Suzanne has really been, you know, that release has helped us establish digital distribution, mean, physical distribution. And so um, it'll be our first record we distribute in Europe and Japan, actually. Amazing. Uh, all I imagine there'd be a huge demand for it. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I did the, the Japan order. We didn't even solicit it. We had a Japan <laughs> importer contacted us and asked, basically sent us an invoice, and we we're like, "Yes, wow, <laughs> we've never had we've never had that happen." It's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, That's so great. Yeah. yeah, I love the Obi strip too. Oh yeah, I want to do that sometime. That's a- yeah. Um, we had the filmmaker help us work on the art for it. Um, sure. That vinyl and the clear vinyl, yeah, this looks great. Looks so. Yeah, good. we almost did pink, and then I'm so glad we did clear. Did yeah, clear well, the clear. I'm a fan of clear. Actually, the next record I do, I want it to be clear. I, I feel like it really lets the album artwork speak for itself. You know, there's so many people are obsessed with the vinyl color, but I yeah. feel like if you have great artwork and in st- stunning, captivating artwork like this one, then clear kind of gets out of the way for that. Yeah. You know, for the package. Yeah, totally agree. Do you, you, I've seen you guys have done CDs and tapes. Uh, um, is there like one you prefer? Is there a format that you gravitate towards or what guides your decision uh, of what format to give a record when you're, when you're making a new release? Mm, that might be a big question or a big answer. <laughs> the, um, I think, um, really based on like the number of releases we take on and, Kind of based on like maybe the activity of the band themselves. Um, you know, some bands uh, is they are maybe not jumping into doing a tour. They are you know uh, all the members have day jobs. We have you know some bands like that, and it, you know it just kind of really depends on like what the trajectory that we can discuss with the band. Mm-hmm. And I think going into twenty twenty, our strategy was to. Uh, release vinyl for bands that were going to tour, and we were trying to sign bands that were going to tour, and, and were really clearly, you know, going all in to be a full time musician. And, and that's just something we just, just discovered during the A and R and signing process and stuff like that. Uh, I think we just try to have like an open conversation of, about the investment around the release. And uh, yeah, I know you what know, you mean. Yeah, and and so um, then really the the touring thing just sort of died on us. That was like our real big like strategy going into twenty twenty. We was we were gonna align tours with record stores, get them in the stores, get in stores set up. Like we were we had this we really mapped it out. We were we scoped in our like number of releases so that we could support that that process and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it just you know suddenly changed sure, with yeah. the pandemic, um, and I guess now we are trying to establish hopefully uh, confidence from record stores and distributors of selling our releases, and and also also we sell a good amount through our website. And we did just um, I mean since the tours stopped, you know uh, we had to reconsider how we were going to move this merch <laughs> and all this new vinyl we had just pressed. Uh-huh. Um, so we did just create a library card is what we're calling it. Okay. And what's that? Um, 
And so it's just a monthly mail subscription where it's $14.99 a month and you get merch mailed to you once a month. That's that value of $25. Oh, nice. So now, and we haven't really promoted it just yet, but we've actually already had two people sign up because it's on our website, but we haven't like advertised it at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's uh, awesome. Yeah, we're working on a little video to kind of explain how it works to people right now. And um, hopefully that'll get some of all those pressings we did moving. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, and so I would say we did mostly vinyl or tape in the beginning because we uh, are nostalgic like that. But <laughs> then we kind of realized with some of the newer bands that. Um, maybe CDs were more appropriate for that band. Right. Um, yeah, I yep. have a like. I have this sense that that CDs are gonna find a, a come back and find a little bit of a place. I mean, not that not that they're gonna, you know, uh, outsell any other particular media, but I I just I'm not sure they're willing to completely die right yet. I am glad you bring that up because I actually feel like I'm like the uncool person to say that all the time. I've heard it said uh, quite a few times. <laughs> Don't worry, yeah, you're not alone. Like, um, like as we've been making decisions on, we 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 need to really pull back on vinyl until we knew that we had a. As Bree was describing, a, getting all the catalog that we just pressed all in the last few months, push it going for us. Mm. Um, and but as I've talked to. You know, newer artists of other upcoming releases, CDs have really, uh, really come to mind. I've, I've wanted to make just a nice CD, like uh, with a booklet and multiple pages. Uh, I, I've realized just how nice those can be if sure. done, done well. Yeah, it's really just a tangible art piece, and everything comes with a digital download, which is what today's society really wants anyway. So. Even with the library card, if we're sending people cassette tapes and they're unlikely to have a cassette tape player yeah. even, possibly, um, it comes with the digital download. It's really just a piece of art. Yeah, in, right. In a way. Right. And and are you doing uh, Spotify and Apple Music for all of your releases? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I would, only a couple of exceptions, yeah. Um, yeah, I will, I will say one thing I really, maybe I can we can kickstart this through this podcast. <laughs> the uh, one thing that I would love to see is like more music products that just don't have any listening capabilities at all. Oh. Um, like, because assuming that people are going to listen to them on, you know, digital platforms and other yeah, things, yeah. Yeah. like things that are just sort of everything else. In a lot of ways, I like look at it like an LP, like just the jacket. Right. Uh, like that would be such a great product. And you, you, if it just. Oh, man. Like that's all it is. It's like no vinyl. It's just it's just everything but the vinyl. Um, <laughs> that's going to be a hard sell, Brian. But I love it. I know. I'm I like, love it. I hear what you're saying, but I also think it's confusing. No, you know what? This yeah. is a. It's a very. It, you're a very ahead of the time. This is a very Steve Jobs thought you're having right now. <laughs> he uh, is an IT guy. So. <laughs> yeah, I I know exactly exactly what you mean. Uh, and by golly, uh, printing a jacket without having to do the gold plating and all the the vinyl, that, that certainly would bring the cost down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really cool thought. That is a really cool thought. And, and sometimes, initially, when you said that, I, I get kind of turned off because I think of like whenever they started doing in the early 2000s, like the USB sticks with MP3s on it or... Like I think of like a keychain or something, but I mean I I don't want crap in my house. But at the same time, there is something beautiful about um, the artwork of a of a record and and reading that and holding that while listening. Um, so if there is some way, maybe it's a book, maybe it's a magazine. But I totally I hear the sentiment there for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just like a, you'd almost have to like have like a name for it or something. If like I just, I, I mean, people can make books and stuff like that, but it, I don't know if you could build something around it until you really conceptualize it. But yeah, mm -hmm. now more people were doing it, maybe too. I think would help, and <laughs> yeah, it became. But 
Maybe we can join forces one day and figure that out. <laughs> yeah, that I'm going to put that in the old uh, noggin and just <laughs> chew on it. I, I do. I do know what you're saying though, and that's it's that tangible thing, and that's why I think for some reason CDs um, went through this phase of where like people just loathed them. Like for some reason, it was just like. I, I looked at some of the CDs I bought, you know, in the early, maybe mid to late 2000s. And I was like, oh, what a waste of money. I wish I'd save my money and just bought the vinyl or something. And But now I feel like they're coming around and I'm like, they're the same type of tangible feel as a cassette. Um, and quite frankly, a little bit more playable than a cassette. And mm-hmm. and then there's al- there already is the nostalgia factor. Like I'm looking to do a CD with like the clear case, you know, with like the clear tray. Um, I I kind of miss that now. Oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was. Brant's favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I like I think like um yeah like there's some really nice CDs with a clear tray with the image behind it and yeah. like multiple page booklet and yeah it's like it's you well, know. It's uncompressed audio and everything too, so you're getting higher fidelity. And um, well, yeah, we wanna... we started doing when we started doing cassettes in the last um, couple of years that we were, we did cassettes. Um, it was or sorry of CDs. Um, we were doing these like print on demand things where it was a digital printing on a, a heavy stock. Then they folded it twice. And then they would do CDRs with like digital printing on the CDR. And then it was like a wallet or an envelope or like a CD pocket or a CD wallet. So it was like a pocket, but with an extra fold. And and then they would put the CD in and then sometimes shrink wrap it. And so it got you pretty close to that digipack, which back in the 2000s was really... Um, uh, desirable, like Digipax was like the cool thing to have. Um, but then to me, it just ended up being kind of like because it was all digital and it was all like quickly put together. That really devalued the CD for me when it became just these little like paper wallets. So I feel like I need to now go back to the the case and you know all that stuff. Yep. 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 <laughs> anyway, sorry, a little CD <laughs> tangent. I wasn't planning on. No. Having. Yeah. We're. On the same page. I'm actually looking around my desk for like one of my a CD I reference all the time. Is we're like we need to make stuff like this, uh, and it is just in a jewel case, just like you described. Mm. It's also, I mean, kind of similar to the photography aspect in my brain because you know now we're in this digital world that people just have all these digital images and not very often do they like even print them or have the totally. tangible object. Um, but yeah, that's like another thing we also restore and run classic photo booths <laughs> which are oh, just great. like one of a kind photos of a tangible object i guess yeah so hey have you guys ever read the book um the revenge of analog <laughs> no okay sounds appropriate yeah. yeah you should um the author's name is david Sachs. he's canadian i've had him on this show actually and cool. um, but the book is called The Revenge of Analog, and you should really check it out. It's it's okay. just a it's basically talking about uh, what we're talking about now, but a lot of some of the the philosophies behind it. And uh, cool. yeah, it's a great book. I really loved it. Anyway, I'm I'm curious um, how you guys find new listeners, and I mean, you know, marketing is such a huge challenge for labels. I'm curious what you guys find uh, works best for you when it comes to you know, reaching new listeners and, and, and getting the word out. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll kind of tell our whole story around that. Um, I think, um, in the early days we, um, decided that we were going to focus on our own social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're lucky to have, uh, you know, I think we really have a, you know, a couple really prominent artists. We talked about Suzanne earlier, but, uh, uh, another artist we released earlier on was RCD Moore, and okay. and he's like, at least in the particular scene, a a, a mythical figure. He, he's called the Godfather of home recording, and has released I think like four hundred albums or more. And really interesting guy, and has, he has a you know strong cult following. It, we we that really helped us kind of build out our social media in the beginning, and. Uh, 
I, I think we put some focus on just our own audience. Um, uh, and, um, we maintain a playlist and, uh, that's, that's smart. And, yeah. And stuff like that. I, that is, you know, serves as a little bit of a baseline for us, not as, you know, something we really hope to grow, I, I guess, as any label would. And from there, we have experimented with PR maybe about seven or eight times or so. Oh, like yeah. Having an outside company. How'd that go? Uh, mixed results. Sure. I think, uh, sure. I think from a, I think anybody naturally wants those dollars to feel like they equal results. Yeah. But I think it, <laughs> I, I think it really means that somebody's going to do a certain amount of work to try to get results, and um, and you just never really know how things are going to turn out. It's, you know, PR kind of feels a bit mysterious, I feel like at times. And we more recently have just decided to in-house that as much as we can. We main we maintain a a mailing list. We um, that we regularly pitch releases and throughout their cycle too. We uh, are actually, I've, I've listened to this podcast and I hear you know lots of different views on this, but I, we are a heavy user of Submit Hub. Okay. Uh, um, and we've started to just develop relationships with, uh, you know, different YouTube channels, Spotify playlists, as well as blogs through that. They just know Great. that we're, you know, you know, submitting a certain type of stuff. We even we even give our bands just full access to our submit hub. We we maintain credits and say, hey, use them if you can. Oh, cool. Uh, um, it just seems like a kind of hard to overspend on submit hub, and and so or at least comparative to the full cost of PR camp outside PR yeah, campaigns. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and that's um, worked for you. Like you've fa- you've been able to build relationships with certain bloggers or YouTubers. Yeah, I think it, like. Um, I think you know our goal would be to hit, to hit some bigger mainstream press things, but we have started to build like uh, I would call like more of like an internet underground kind of following of things that are really popular on YouTube or Spotify, sure. like certain, play, certain playlists and things. And I sort of pride ourselves on you know being outside of some of the mainstream press. Yeah. But, yeah. but we we hope to you know hit some of the bigger publications. Uh, kind of. Sometimes I, I feel pretty confident in the release landing a few different um, outlets, and some of those outlets consistently give us, you know, during those first few months, several thousand monthly listeners. Wow! Um, that's I think that's where our kind of goal is right now uh, is hitting, you know, especially for a brand new artist to get to the hundreds or the the uh, hundreds of listeners to uh, you know a couple of thousand listeners would be sort of like our hope and yeah and that's hard to do yeah it really is it's not definitely. it's not easy definitely uh, i think um you know just having a certain like stylistic niche for some of our releases has allowed us to find like find like five to ten publications that regularly cover us and give us some meaningful listeners even if it is just a few hundred or or something like that and um, I think that's sort of kind of the extent of our PR right now. And um, I, th- I think that can actually go almost further than getting a big mainstream coverage because, you know, I've heard they're not um, always like the big windfall that we imagine them to be. Um, but I would, I would definitely imagine that more targeted blogs. I mean, if I'm going to a site or a, a curator for a very distinct ambient sound, um, I'm more likely to be engaged than if I'm going to Rolling Stone and they present me with thousands of different genres. Yeah, I definitely feel like in any art industry, really, it's like you kind of want to grow with people that are at your level mm. uh, together. So, you know, hopefully we'll That's us smart. and the small art <laughs> yeah. blog will grow up together and be big one day. That's smart. Oh, I've oh for sure. I've seen that before. It, it, yeah, and it, it makes you... Glad that you didn't dismiss them, you know, when when they were yeah. small and you were small and you were only looking for big coverage. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And, and and I love the idea of a, a Spotify playlist. There's something about, and, I, and I'm looking at your playlist now with over 200 followers. There's something great about like essentially owning your audience and not having to, you know, and, and in years from now when that's 
in the thousands, like, you know, you can just put something up there and instantly a few thousand people hear it. Um, it's just nice to own that type of uh, promotion in-house as opposed to paying another or finding another curator to promote you. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know if this, this topic has come up on other podcasts, Scott, but I we have also looked at like highly targeted ads on Facebook. We've ran that for one, oh. one band recently. Oh, yeah. How'd uh-huh. that go? I, I thought it was a really good process. We did um, A B split testing along the way. Okay. Like, um, like the first thing that we did was, and we worked with actually an outside. PR yeah, I, I was going to ask. Okay. Yeah, and they and I we learned a lot in the process. So basically, we picked a video. We had the video start at sort of like a good time in the video, like yeah. kind of past the intro and stuff like that. The video itself played out to the end, like it was a music video, but uh-huh. the, the start of it was maybe like a, a minute or so into it or something like that. Okay, and, and it was just a good point in the video to start. And then we uh, cast a wide net uh, using pretty big artists and stuff that would kind of be affiliated. Okay. Uh, and uh, we came out with various headlines and we ran the ad with each different headline. And uh, we saw which one performed better. Then we ran more ads on that and we kept uh, retargeting it based on who engaged. Wow. And, and so we eventually got it down to our ad spend was a lot less because we had gotten people that were actually engaged in, in it. And so and then um, what did you want them to do once they were converted? So our kind of, I think, thought process on it was to just build the audience at first and so just give them content. So they really didn't have to, uh, there was no destination outside the video. Okay. And then the second um, uh, round we we did, once we had gotten the audience figured out, we, we did the video with a little Spotify link below it. Okay. And in Facebook, you can kind of make a hybrid video and the link itself takes you to Spotify. Okay, cool. And, and so we... I uh, did that, and yeah, we were just trying to, uh, I think, just drop listeners there. And I would say we we saw engagement. It was it was like you. It was the first one of the first few things I think we did where we thought like the investment like aligned with some you know result that it, it's not, there was no like direct ROI, right? You know? But it was it was more measurable than other uh, things. Yeah, definitely. Like it definitely felt more you know results driven than. I think some of the PR campaigns and I think yeah. kind of recognizing that we were expecting publications to put it on their social media. Like that was sort of like the destination anyway. And I don't know. I thought, I thought it was it's going pretty good. I, I hope it, it may end up being like our model for all of our releases, but we're, I think we're you know, still experimenting with that. So you're on, you're doing this on Facebook. Is it, is it crossed over to Instagram or is it just Facebook? Uh, both Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, and are you working? You said you were working with an agency. Were they like music entertainment specific, or were they just an agency who knew how to do Facebook ads? It was music specific. It actually okay. was the PR the PR company we were using previously. Oh, okay. They, they kind of had gotten into that. That's really yeah, cool. But also the artist that we chose is the one we've hired now on the label. So he was learning the process all along the way. So hopefully. Oh, that's smart. We can just have him continue to do it for the other band. Yeah, I've heard I've heard good things um, and from from other people, and uh, so yeah, I mean, I've always been really curious, but also a little intimidated by the the whole process because you can really waste money. Oh yeah, yeah. You you have to be. I think certainly looking at like the long term investment in that artist social media page, right? Like uh, it. Um, cause that's probably where most of the value ends up sitting, like the number of followers on that page or, or things that are gained through it, um, or that account. So it's a little less connected to the music itself. And, um, but I've even, yeah. Can you, can you f- like say, can it be as simple as saying, you know, if your band uh, sounds like, um, I, I don't know, like some sort of, popular indie rock band that a lot of people would know um and 
could you target your ad to just people who follow that band on Instagram? Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, um, it's because uh, I mean, kind of, yeah, it's more tied to the interests that are stored on the Facebook uh, side, actually. But right, yeah, you can you could find anybody that is interested in that artist, and as long as that audience is big enough for Facebook to allow you to do. Oh, I see. Do it, Right. Like sometimes you might have to add multiple, they won't, you can't run ads for like, you know, 500 people or something like yes. that. Yeah. Um, so you have to like build out a certain size audience. So you might have to pick five bands and sure and stuff like that. Yeah. I've, I've had an ad recently, um, uh, an Instagram stories that somebody is, is sending me and it's for a playlist of like a certain genre. And I don't know how they know, but like, um, the playlist, like just it looks, the aesthetic is appealing to me. The title of the playlist is appealing to me. So I just kind of think, like, wow, this is like a pretty decent ad. And um, I wonder, like, how this, how I could do something like this because driving people to your playlist or driving people to an artist's Spotify account. I mean, if you could get somebody who likes this genre to follow you on Spotify, that's a pretty big thing because then they're notified of all your releases moving forward. Yeah, I think that's pretty much our main yeah. goal. Yeah. yeah, Spotify. Following at the artist level on Spotify, yeah, I think that is sort of the the biggest like thing an artist can gain because you're right, like every release after that, they're going to get notified. It's going to show up on their you know, various playlists and things like that. Well, and, yeah, and I think, I mean, you obviously, you could, in theory, you could send them to the artist band camp but for them to hear an ad and then be shot over to a $25 vinyl pre-order, that's just going to be a huge leap. In my opinion, it's better to go to stream me for free for the next three months. Let me convert you over there. And then, you know, uh, I'll, I'll sell you on a vinyl. Exactly. I think that, that would be a stock where you definitely would want to basically follow because then you, you could make your next targeted ads to just your own fans. Right. Uh, oh, that's cool. So yeah, you can kind of you can build the fans, and you can then do the higher thing on them. But that's, that's a that's a lofty challenge to go through. That you know, growing of an audience. But that's basically, I think, would be the ideal scenario. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's cool. Listen, guys, this is such a cool label you have, and such a cool um, process that the both of you are working together on it. Um, I I wish you all the luck, and and thank you so much for doing this episode. Thanks, Scott. Really yeah. Appreciate thanks. It. Thanks for talking with us. It was great to meet you, and I'm 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 looking forward to checking out that Suzanne record, and um, I'm gonna obviously be following you for for the, the foreseeable future until you do something to make me mad. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> we'll keep listening. <laughs> And thank all of you folks at home for listening. Um, This has been such a fun conversation. I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to check out earthlibraries.com and check them out on Bandcamp and give them a follow on social media. Such a fun conversation. And I hope you found that conversation inspiring or encouraging or you get little tidbits ideas. And and I've been getting these messages on, on Instagram and on uh, email, you know, people and on our, our Facebook group. By the way, if you're not a part of our Facebook group, please go to our website, otherrecordlabels.com. There's a Facebook link at the bottom and join that group. The conversations are really heating up. We're hitting 500 members this week, which is so incredible. Uh, so please join that. But I love hearing from you um, where you guys are getting ideas and are basically having this little masterclass um, through these interviews by just learning from all of these labels. And, you know, it's been over 50 different record labels now. And I think that's just so cool um, that all of us are able to learn from these people, uh, regardless of the stage or the size of a label. You know, everyone has these ways of doing things. And I love um, making notes myself and stealing their ideas and hopefully getting better at being a record label from learning from these great labels. So thank you so much for listening. Head over to otherrecordlabels.com. You can send me a message. Check out some of our free resources there, including our marketing checklist. And uh, thank you so much for listening.